Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro, and today we're going to be talking about fragility fractures. Joining me is Dr. Risa Kagan. Welcome, Risa. Thank you. Risa, in addition to being a NAM certified menopause practitioner, is a certified clinical densitometrist and serves on the scientific and medical advisory board of the nonprofit organization Foundation for Osteoporosis Research and Education, American Bone Health. She's a clinical professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Reproductive Sciences at the University of California in San Francisco. So let's start first with a definition of what a fragility fracture is. Well, a fragility fracture is when somebody is standing height and trips and falls from their standing height and sustains a major fracture. And from what age do we look at uh, a fragility fracture? Is it all ages or at a particular age? Well, we start talking about it with women and men um, and adults, I mean, over 40, over 50. And you, in, in reality, uh, people fracture when they're younger, and there's some issue with that, too. If they're standing and you fall from standing height only, this is not like falling from a ladder, mm -hmm. falling from a building. Not traumatic. No, it's a non-traumatic fracture because it really signifies something wa wrong with somebody's bone quality. All right, so let's start there for a moment because often patients will feel it was icy, I fell, you too, doc, would have fractured your wrist. Are there certain bones that we are more concerned about and other bones that we discount? Well, obviously, to be honest, fingers, toes, skull even, are not considered fragility fractures, mm -hmm. but it's the obvious. It's the spine, it is the hip bone, especially in the elderly, um, wrist, forearm, shoulder. Many a time women will come into the office all the time and say, oh, I fell on the ice, it was standing height, that's true, but they fell and they fractured. That is a fragility fracture. So for many physicians, for many years, we've been focused on the bone density. And we use that minus 2.5 as a threshold for diagnosis, a threshold for treatment, without necessarily letting that fragility fracture speak to us. So what about those group of women who seem to have a bone mineral density that doesn't look worrisome by the numbers, but yet they have fragility fractures? Why is it important? Well, I think it's important to say to those women, you really do have osteoporosis. Do you know that? Uh, many people do feel that when someone has a real fragility fracture, even with a bone density that's better than minus 2.5, by definition, they really do have something wrong with their bone strength. Bone strength is made up of quality and density. That bone density is excellent, and about 70% of bone strength is related to bone density, but there is this other percentage that says something about their intrinsic um, uh, quality. Right. So when they fall, they fracture. And we can't necessarily measure we quality. We cannot measure quality, that's true. So why is this so important? You know, we talk about a heart attack is the biggest risk for your next heart attack. Is the same true for bone? We call it a bone attack. That's a good word. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's what I say to patients. You have like a bone attack. Yes, when you have a fragility fracture, you have an exponential increased risk for more fractures. So we want to avoid that first fracture. And the data shows that in a woman's lifetime especially, they have a 50% chance over the age of 50 of having a fragility fracture in the remaining lifetime. And many people you know, forget that fractures can be associated with mortality. The morbidity and mortality associated within the first year of a hip fracture, about 20% of women have not just morbidity and hospitalization and immobilization and maybe nursing homes, but they die. They get pulmonary embolism, they get pneumonia, and they can die. Do we as clinicians sometimes miss the boat of recognizing that there has been this event after the age of 40 that perhaps the Collie's fracture or whatever is not so innocent? Absolutely, and it's not just as physicians, patients. Do you know there's so much data about women who leave, and men, I have to remember the male in this too, they leave the hospital having had a hip fracture, having been treated, and there's no diagnosis on the chart of this being osteoporosis or even considered a fragility fracture. So at this point, while we always talk about lifestyle management, bone hygiene, calcium D that's appropriate, appropriate exercise, are we now looking at a group that really requires pharmacological therapy? There are many, we're trying to start fracture intervention programs in the country because when somebody has a fragility fracture, for certain they should be treated and evaluated by and any it, a healthcare provider who is concerned about bone, basically, I was going to say a metabolic bone specialist, endocrinologist, women's health specialist, but it could be really anybody interested in bone. But our goal is to identify these women before they have their fragility fracture 
and to get them treated based on their risk factors as well as that bone mineral density, that bone density test. So that very famous study by Ethel Cyrus showed doctors that in fact 60% of women or so will fracture before that minus 2.5 ma major number. So how do you evaluate? You basically, first of all, all women at 65 and older should have a bone density. Mm -hmm. Under 65, we look at risk factors, and we also put people into something called FRACS, Fracture Risk Assessment Tool. It's a, it's a tool that's been validated in every country, and if they have a risk over 20% in their lifetime in the next 10 years of a fracture, or 3% for a hip fracture, those patients should be counseled about pharmacotherapy, and we have outstanding therapies now to prevent fractures, preventing that first fracture as well as a recurrent fracture. But beyond that, I like to educate patients, besides the things, the lifestyle approach, of course, balance. To prevent fractures, you really want to make sure that you have strength, and you really need to work on your balance as we age, both men and women. Can you briefly give the clinician who's listening to us the broad areas of classes of medications that they can consider and why the route of administration might matter, the ability of the patient to follow instructions correctly? Right. right. Well, we do have a problem because we have great medicines, but we know that co compliance, persistence is very low in this country. Um, the younger women, when I say younger, I mean, you know, 50 to 65, many of those women, if they have other symptoms, might be a good candidate for hormone therapy. Hormone therapy in the right patient, w weighing the risk benefits, really can prevent fractures. Um, over and beyond that, we also have CIRM, selective e estrogen receptor modulators, which is another class of agent that, you know, the 50 to 65 year old woman who's healthy might really do well on, again, preventing fractures. Then there's a big class of agents called bisphosphonates. They are the bone drugs. Mm -hmm. And we have oral agents, we have them weekly, monthly, and even yearly in an IV therapy. So we have oral agents, we have IV therapy that all have been shown to reduce spinal vertebral fractures by 50% and hip fractures for the most part around 30%. And then we also have some other, I mean, many people can't take oral agents. You right. have to take it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. People forget to take it, you know, and, and less than 1% is absorbed even in the best of circumstances. So not only do we have the IV parenteral bisphosphonate, we also have a shot now twice a year that works in a different way. Um, and it also uh, stops bone resorption and can stop fractures as well. And monoclonal then antibody. Monoclon monoclonal antibody, um, denosumab it's called, and it's a twice a year subcutaneous injection and is highly effective in preventing fractures. And then finally, as an anabolic agent? We have one anabolic agent right now, new drugs in the pipeline, hopefully it will be more. Right now there's a one anabolic agent, which is a daily injection that you take uh, subcutaneously, generally up to about two years, but one thing I will always say to every patient, if you're going to go on the anabolic agent that's available, you must have a plan of action for after you're done right. with that agent because you'll just lose all that you gained. It doesn't linger in bone, it doesn't stay in bone. You just lose the efficacy the minute you stop it. So if you are going to go on this anabolic agent, you should take that for say two years and then maybe go on a bisphosphonate to maintain what you've built. Bottom line, message about a fragility fracture to our clinicians who are with us today? To identify your patients and get them evaluated and treated. All too often, too many women and men go by and they have had fractures and they don't consider them a fracture. They tripped on the curb, you know, going to the supermarket. They had a collie's fracture, they had a shoulder fracture. That's a fragility fracture. Make the diagnosis, get that patient evaluated and treated, and we have great options uh, available in 2015. <laughs> thank you so much, Teresa. Yes, thank you for inviting me.